Good to see you, everyone. My name is Robbie Howell. I am a tabletop game designer who enjoys torturing himself by imagining the unattainable. And today we'll be doing another of my world-famous Age of Empires II theory crafts. For those who don't know what this is, this is a process by which I take a real-life historical medieval civilization and I attempt to implement it in a theoretical sense in the wonderful game Age of Empires II, both as a test of my own game design skills and to give me an excuse to share with you a cool and likely semi-forgotten civilization that was once a major player on the world stage and that now, I think, deserves a place in this wonderful game that I would recommend to everyone I know. Today's civilization is a bit of an unusual one. It's an often misunderstood civilization with few surviving records, but it's one I think could be a great fit for the game as we know it now. And that civilization is the Wagadugans. <laughs> You might know them better as the Ghanaians. Right now, they kind of exist in the game in the form of the Malians, which were a related people. But the Wagadoons are much older than the Malians and have a distinct enough identity and history that I think they would make a fantastic addition to this lovely game. Let's get started, shall we? Before we jump into it, however, a couple of disclaimers. As always, I am not a historian. This is particularly relevant for this theory craft, as there is a lot of bad history surrounding the Wagadugans. There's a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of people just making stuff up, and there are a lot of repeated sources where websites are clearly just copying Wikipedia. So I did the best I could, but just know that there are more likely to be historical errors in this one than there may have been in some of my other videos. Additionally, as always, I have not been able to test any of what I'm talking about. It we're pure, purely going off a of theory here, but hopefully theory will be enough for entertainment's sake. And of particular note, while there are a great many excellent Age of Empires theory crafting videos and resources out there on the internet, I have not consulted any of these for the purposes of my build here. I'm doing it purely off of my own imagination and research. Uh, additionally, as a game designer myself, I tend to favor complexity and I really enjoy variety. The more civilizations that we have and the more distinct all of them are, the better the game will be, in my humble opinion. Lastly, I try to be as faithful to the original history as possible in my mechanical implementation, so a lot of the, the stuff that I put in here will be rather literalist in terms of how it translates to the Wagadugan's actual history, as opposed to other more subtle and streamlined bonuses that you might find a little more commonly in the game as we know it now. So let's begin with some history, shall we? Wagadugu has gone by many different names. In fact, the name Wagadugu itself is largely contested in terms of its source and origin. It is, after all, the capital of Burkina Faso. That being said, I decided to go with that name over a name like Ghana, which is a lot easier, because the word Ghana literally translates to war chief. And as such, saying it was the Ghana Empire would be like saying it's the, the King Kingdom, which is kind of dumb, I guess. So I, I went with Wagadugu. It's fun to say, it's interesting. And they were located there. Now, ethnically speaking, the Wagadugans were not a single people. They were actually a great number of different tribes that all all united, nominally speaking, under a single banner. The majority of them were, however, of the Soninke people, and as such the language, which we'll be getting into later, will be Soninke in origin. Additionally, they quickly rose to prominence once it was discovered just how much the Europeans, the Muslims, and all the other people up north loved gold, and Wagadugu had mountains of it. This was a trend later continued in Mali, its successor, but the Wagadugans were the people who initiated the entire gold from Africa craze that dominated Europe and the Middle East and pretty much all of the known world through much of the early and high Middle Ages. Uh, this also allowed the Wagadugans to fund a great number of expansions into surrounding areas, they conquered more tribes, and they gained more influence. Of course, they were primarily trading with members of the Umayyad Caliphate, uh, however, this would evolve over the years. They'd have many trading partners, though the majority of them would be Islamic caravans crossing the Sahara. As mentioned, there were a great many tribes that made up Wagadugu, among them the Mandinka, who would later give rise to the Kingdom of Mali. But it wasn't just these local tribes that the Wagadugans were contending with. A much greater threat were the Berbers from the north. 
This Islamic power would frequently raid south, drawn by the promise of gold and slaves and other forms of plunder. And so this led to a great many wars between the fiercely independent Wagadugans and the invading Berber horsemen. These on and off wars by some sources went on for upwards of 250 years and eventually ended up with the Wagadugans kicking out the Almoravids, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Almoravid Berbers specifically. Now, these Berber wars did do a lot to bankrupt the Wagadugan state, and it's quite possibly because of that that the leading Soninke peoples were overthrown, first by the Soso tribes, and then later on by the Mandinka, the Malians. Th this fracturing caused the once unified state to break apart into, I think, like 10 or 11 sub-kingdoms, many of which were later subsumed by Mali, and after Mali fell, they crumbled into nothingness. So. Mali moved in to what was previously Wagadugu, but that wasn't the end of what I would call the Wagadugan Empire. As mentioned, there were a great many states that fractured off and developed their own identities, and a few of them actually got quite powerful. Now, the Malians were the most powerful of all, but there was one particular state that I think succeeded the spirit of the Wagadugan Empire much more than any of their other successors, including Mali, that being the Jolof. Now, the Jolof inhabited Senegal and the Gambia and, and that sort of region of West Africa. And they were a pretty impressive power for being a relatively small kingdom in terms of their total area. I believe they only inhabited a parcel of land about the size of the Netherlands during their entire dynasty. But despite that, they had an incredibly powerful army. They had a good navy. Uh, they traded heavily with Portugal, and as such became one of the first African powers to really develop strong ties with the Christian states of Europe. In fact, I believe that a few Jolof princes were actually sheltered by the Portuguese back in Lisbon when their states were under threat from probably Berbers or something. It was usually the Berbers in this part of Africa. So in summary, the Wagadugans had quite the sordid history. Uh, one that fortunately translates into all sorts of beautiful flavor for us to enjoy today. In-game, their architecture would be, of course, African. In this case, I'm also giving them unique skins for the castle and market. Castle because it seems to be the trend these days. And the market because, as we'll discuss later, the market will be an essential part of Wagadugan playstyle. So that gets a unique skin. As mentioned, their language would be Soninke. Anakamoho, friends. It goes without saying that this was definitely not the only language spoken within the Wagadugan domains, but it was probably the most prominent one, so I thought it was representative enough to throw in here. The wonder for this civilization was a little tricky for me, as there aren't a lot of sources describing what their realm might have looked like, nor are there a great many ruins that depict what it might have looked like. However, I thought that an artistic reimagining of the ruins of Kumbisale could be quite beautiful in-game. Imagine this old dusty ruin brought to life as some sort of market square or something to look more like what it might have looked like in the historical context. I think that could look really cool. A quick sidebar before we go on. I suddenly realized that I'd been using the term Wagadugu to refer to this country when in fact it was more likely to have been called Wagadu. Uh, Wagadugu is, of course, a city in Burkina Faso. And while there is some evidence that this kingdom was called Wagadugu, um, I found Wagadu to be a little bit more common in the historical sources that I consulted. Namely Wikipedia. So I, I feel like Wagadu itself might be a better term for the kingdom. Uh, just something that I caught myself doing, and I, I don't think it's a huge deal either way, but it is it bears mentioning that there is some contention as to which term is more accurate. Either way, Wagadugans would likely be the name of the people who inhabited it. Moving on to campaigns, there are no shortage of interesting and colorful characters in Wagadugan history. Uh, the first of them being, of course, the legendary founder of the country, a man named Dinga. He was said to have come from the east, the far east, and came out of the desert and colonized and, and f asserted power among the tribes. But he is not going to be one of our potential protagonists. The reason being is that there is almost no information about him, at least not on the internet from what I could find. There is, however, a little bit of info about his sons. Diabe Sise was his oldest, I believe, and once Dinga died, he left his domain to his two sons, who immediately, as sons do, started fighting. Diabe and his brother Kine fought a bloody civil war among the burgeoning united tribes of what would later be Wagadu, 
And once Diabe triumphed, he then led a aggressive campaign to colonize and conquer as many of the surrounding tribes as possible, establishing himself as the first of a great many gold lords that would go on to rule the nation of Wagadu for centuries beyond. Uh, he is definitely a bit of a mythologized character, but is a cool fella, and I really like the idea of a war between brothers being the hook for a campaign. Uh, beyond Diabe Sise, there is the legendary Tunka Manin. This guy came in during the Berber Wars that rocked the nation later on. And at the core of these wars was a well-entrenched religious tension between Islam and local African animism. Uh, obviously, African animism had been in this part of the world for like well over a millennia at this point, and Islam was a, a very militant and young religion coming in and trying to establish a foothold. And there were both Muslims and animists all over Wagadu at this point. Tunkamanin was stuck in this position where he has a, a, a divided nation, divided down religious lines. There are invaders coming in, and part of his nation actually supports the invaders because of their religious ideas. And so this left Tunkamanin in a really tough position, and what he eventually ended up doing is rallying and cobbling together as much of a defensive coalition as he could in the face of the Berber invasion, and mounting as good of a defense as could be hoped in the face of this incredibly powerful, mobile, and militant group of tribes uh, swarming in out of the Sahara. Tokamanin was a really cool character who played a central part in what I see as being almost the fundamental issue of the Wagadu nation, that being Islam versus animism. But moving on to the later state of Jolof, uh, we have Ndiadiane Ndiaye. This fellow is thought to have been the founder of Jolof, throwing off the yoke of his Malian rulers in the face of their oppression and growing weakness. And once he consolidated power on the coast of Africa, he immediately had to prepare for a slew of potential threats, rivals, and invasions. In his case, specifically, the Fulani peoples. So his campaign would largely be against a combination of Malians, a little bit of Berbers, and the Fulani people themselves, which you could represent as Ethiopians. Or you could introduce a whole Fulani civilization, which I highly endorse and will likely tackle at some point in the not-too-distant future. Either way, cool character. The Jolof are a fascinating kingdom and absolutely belong to be in the game as represented here through the Wagadugans. Now beyond their own campaigns, I could see the Wagadugans appearing very specifically in the existing Sunjata campaign. Uh, unfortunately, they weren't really expansive enough to show up in any other campaigns that exist currently in the game, but Sunjata would be full of them. The, the character of Sunjata himself fought against the Soso constantly, and they could be easily represented by Wagadu to contrast the old powers of Wagadu versus the new powers of Mali. Not to mention, I believe Wagadu is actually featured in the second Sunjata scenario, so that's an obvious shoe in if you ask me. And that's just the campaigns we have now. I think that there are tons of potential African campaigns that could be created, all of which could feature the Wagadugans rather prominently, as they were effectively the first great kingdom of West Africa in the Middle Ages. So the history of Wagadu, while it is somewhat fractured and inconsistent, it does have a number of prominent recurring themes that I took as my guiding lights when designing their mechanics. Uh, first of all, gold. There's gold and them thar hills. And even though the legendary wealth of people like Mansa Musa would be several centuries away under the Malians, the Wagadugans were known as the Lords of Gold as far away as Rome from a much earlier point in history. Uh, they obviously started up the Trans-Sahara caravan trade. Salt they prized beyond even gold itself, and so regularly imported it, while slaves they were able to frequently export as early as 700 AD. It was kind of the second backbone of their economy after gold itself. The contention between Islam and animism, as I mentioned earlier, is also a huge piece of what made their history unique. Uh, the Berber invasions obviously were reflective of how much this had weakened Wagadu, as well as kind of reinforced Islam's presence even after the Berbers were eventually driven back. While this would lead to division, there was a lot of cultural entwining of both Islam and animism in Wagadugan society. 
Frequently, they would take a traditional animist ritual, incorporate a couple of Islamic elements, and call it a day, which obviously the migrant scholars and merchants from the north would strongly disapprove of, but the locals would take up as a defining aspect of their culture. So with my review of their history completed, let's move on to how I implemented these elements in-game. If you're only here for the history, this would be the time that you can tune out. Thank you so much for watching. For those of you who are interested in Age of Empires 2 itself, on a more technical level, let's dive into what Wagadu would be good at. To start off with, feudal raiding. These guys, as mentioned, consolidated a lot of power among the local tribes in the fledgling days of their empirehood. And as such, I have given them a number of very powerful early bonuses, mostly revolving around the almighty Camel Rider. Specifically, the Wagadugans can create camels in the feudal age, and their camels are substantially cheaper. Of note, their camels would be substantially weaker in a feudal age, though certainly able to take on most other units you'd be fighting at that time, and would automatically get boosted up to their normal power as soon as you clicked up to castle age. More importantly, in some ways, their camel units can trade as though they were trade carts. This means that anytime you right-clicked on a market, ally or enemy, the camel would pick up a little chunk of gold as soon as they touched it. For an enemy market, they'd pick up the gold as they were delivering their first strike to the building. Then, you could run them back to your own market and have them drop off the gold. The downside, of course, being that they would only trade at half the efficiency of a normal trade card. This would allow early feudal Wagadugan raids to potentially net them gold, while also allowing their camels to stay very versatile in late game, doubling as both economy and military units as your particular situation requires. Now, on top of all these camel bonuses, the Wagadugans are able to sell villagers at the market. This would be done by garrisoning them, at which point the villager would vanish and you'd get a lump sum of gold in your coffers. Uh, like with normal trading at the market, selling villagers would slowly depreciate in terms of its returns over time. And since this is a team bonus, all of your allies are able to sell villagers at the market as well. Now, while villagers are extremely valuable units, getting an immediate lump sum of gold can really help you rebalance your economy when you need it, and can really help the Wagadugans with their timing on specific attacks, techs, and similar. Not to mention giving you something to do with all those useless villagers that you end up having late game. Beyond the Feudal Age, however, the Wagadoons would have a pretty excellent Castle Age. They have full upgrades on a bunch of their relevant units, they have Thumb Ring on their crossbows, they have Bloodlines on their Knights and Camel Riders, and their Camel Riders get that automatic power boost as soon as you hit Castle itself. More interestingly, they have a Civilization bonus where the Technology Caravan will partially affect all of their infantry, archers, and cavalry. Obviously, it won't give them the massive Cobra Car speed boost that you see trade cards getting, but it will be somewhere in the range of 5 to 10%, enough to make them ridiculously fast under the right circumstances once the technology has been researched. Now, once the Wagadugans hit late game, they also have a couple of fantastic economy bonuses, which will help them keep strong in the face of likely more powerful enemy armies. Their relics generate wood at a three times greater rate than they do gold, giving them an extra trickle of resources if they manage to pick up some of those. As mentioned, they can also sell their villagers when they need to. But also they have a unique technology called Tagaza. Tagaza was a legendary city of salt, and it allows you to create the Saltern building. This thing is effectively a gold farm, crewed by a villager and slowly gathering salt over time to be dropped off in exchange for a little chunk of gold. The downside, however, is that while a villager is working, they will very slowly take damage over time requiring that you either use a monk to heal them, or accept that your villagers are expendable and will slowly die off as they are trying to net you resources late game. Additionally, salterns would be gathered from very slowly, even more slowly than a normal farm, meaning that you'd really have to commit a lot of your economy to it if you wanted to have a major boost to your gold. Beyond those strong suits, the Wagadugans would have some other good tools at their disposal. Their cavalry late game would be quite powerful, with pretty much fully upgraded hussars and heavy camels, not to mention their unique unit, the Kuraleme. Now, I couldn't find much information about the Kuraleme besides its name, and the information that it was an elite caste of warriors within Wagadugan society, similar to the Kshatriyas in India. 
What I chose to translate that to was a heavily armored camel unit with all of the bonuses that a camel normally has against enemy cavalry, taking reduced damage from spears, etc., but also with a little bit of bonus damage against enemy spear units, not to mention having much better attack, armor, and health. It would, however, be a bit slower, and would effectively be your knight replacement late game, because the Wagadugans unfortunately miss both Blast Furnace and Cavalier. As such, their late game cavalry will be respectable, but won't quite have the same level of raw power as some other civilizations. They do still have great options at their disposal, and backed up by that amazing gold economy, you should be able to make something happen with them. On top of that, the Wagadugans have something of a cheesy option that they can pull off late game as well, that being castle spam thanks to their unique Lords of Gold technology. This would be available in Imperial Age, and would transmute a castle's stone cost to gold. So you could make a lot of them. Uh, tons, in fact. Unfortunately, they're missing a ton of upgrades on their castles, so they won't be nearly as good as other civilizations, but being able to blanket a portion of the map in pure castledom sounds like a lot of fun and should be a good way of controlling space and getting out more Kuralemes when you need them late game. As you've already noted here, due to the lack of key upgrades, the Wagadugans have a couple of key weaknesses even within their supposed strong suits, and these weaknesses would need to be carefully balanced by a can player hoping to take prime advantage of them. To start off with, as I mentioned already, the Wagadugans would have some trouble late game. They are missing a lot of important technologies, even beyond the ones I've already showed you. Some of them including, you know, halberdier, bracer, ugh, that hurts, siege engineers, all sorts of things that are normally really important for your late game power, they do not have any access to whatsoever. Instead, you need to rely on your amazing late game gold economy to outvalue your opponents through the units that you are able to produce rather than the upgrades on those units. It's a bit of an unusual approach to late game, but it's one that I think the Wagadugans will be able to thrive at, or at the very least should hopefully make them competitive in the late game. Additionally, the Wagadugans have terrible siege, missing a lot of really important options. They're stuck at Mangonel, they don't got Heavy Scorpion, they don't got Siege Ram. I should note they do get Bombard Cannon, but their Bombard Cannons are not particularly powerful. I included that in their tech tree to represent their communication with Portugal towards the end of the Age of Empires II relevant time frame. And as we know, the Portuguese were great at giving guns to people. On top of all of those problems, they also have fairly weak defenses. They can spam castles, but they can't do a whole lot else and need to really rely on good old quantity over quality, which is a common theme with the Wagadugan late game. So how would the Wagadugans likely play? Well, I think you know as well as I that it would start with a whole bunch of early aggression. If your opponent was silly enough to build a market, you could grab some free gold, go in with your early camels, cut up some villagers, sell your own to get some power spikes, all sorts of good stuff. Those cheap, tough camels are really going to do a lot to help you out early on, and the market is going to enable that gold-stealing effect on your camels, not to mention giving you the ability to sell your villagers. So it's even more important for the Wagadugans to build a market early than many other civilizations, even the Saracens. On top of that, your other rushes are perfectly fine and even get a little bit of boost due to that whole villager selling thing to get you some gold when you really need it. As it turns out, that bonus could actually be really great for pretty much any rush you wish to pull off. Moving to the mid-game, however, you'd start to pivot towards a lot of strong fundamental options. You'd have your really fast soldiers thanks to Caravan allowing you to zip over the map and do lightning raids. You have your good knights, you have your good crossbowmen, your siege doesn't suck yet, and so you can really go toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the strongest Castle Age civilizations, especially on the back of any gains you made in Feudal Age. Moving into late game, however, the Wagadugans would really start to flag. You'd need to rely on your cavalry to actually win fights while keeping your gold economy alive so that you can keep producing your power units. If you have to rely on trash, you're probably losing the game. So that's a bit of an overview of how my build of the Wagadugans would look in practice, but there are a couple of other loose threads and ideas that I wanted to mention before we wrap up today. To start off with, I was kind of uncertain as to whether the camel bonuses I gave to them would just be too strong to be feasible for the game. Whenever you try to put a feudal bonus onto a civilization, it does tend to warp its viability for good or ill. This was definitely a bigger problem with my build for the Lombards. Check that video out up here if you get a chance. 
But for the Wagadugans, I think that the camel bonuses could still push them over the edge into unfun and overpowered territory. I could also see people being a bit skeeved out by the idea of having infinite gold on a civilization. I did try to balance it, of course, to make it so that that infinite gold couldn't be too badly exploited, but it's the sort of idea that could definitely get a bunch of people's hackles up. Infinite resources in general are rarely looked upon kindly by the Age of Empires community, and this would likely be no exception, but hopefully the downsides of Salterns would be enough to balance it out and make it feel a little more interactive and interesting. Lastly, I could see some people being a little bit dicey about the idea of having slavery in a game, specifically the idea of selling your villagers. Um, it definitely could be seen as unsavory, but I think it is important to represent a civilization in its entirety, pros and cons. On top of all that, there were a couple of cool ideas I had for the civilization that didn't quite make it into my final draft. Here's a couple of them right here. Uh, I had this idea that gold miners could drop off remotely like Khmer farmers to represent the power of the Wagadugan gold economy. Specifically, they had this interesting arrangement with a jungle tribe where the jungle tribe would bring them gold and they would do this kind of um, mute bargaining process in order to, to exchange for the gold, which they could then go and sell to Europe. Apparently, this institution was in place so that the Wagadugans didn't discover the location of the tribe's secret mine. And also, there was a language barrier that had to be crossed. So just a cool little nugget that I, I found in my research that I thought could be possibly fun to implement, but I liked the other bonuses I had more. I was also toying around with improving their buying and selling rates at the market, similar to the Saracens. Uh, I didn't want to just steal the Saracens effect, so I had it implemented as a triple guilds bonus, but it seemed a little boring. It eventually just got signed line for some of my other ideas. I also thought about monastery texts costing wood instead of gold. A big part of African animism was worship of trees and plant life, and that seemed like a, a cool way of, of doing that justice in-game. Just a little too similar to the Bohemians it ended up being. Um, instant research of monastery texts was also one I had thought about, just because of how readily the, the society was able to integrate the ideas of Islam, but just it's not a very sexy bonus, you know what I mean? There, there's better ones out there. Uh, an idea I liked a good deal more was a unique technology called the Modinu caste. This was in reference to a specific Islamic sect within society. And the idea here was that when you buy or sell at the market, it would reduce the monk price down to a potentially obscene level, just to kind of show how as you trade, more Islamic immigrants come into the nation and start to establish their ideas within your religious institution. I, I really liked this one. I just ended up finding that the mechanics didn't mesh as well with the rest of the build than the ones I ended up going with. I didn't really want the sieve to end up being entirely monastery and monk focused, you know what I mean? Um, I also had this idea for a unique technology called Lamanes, which was in reference to a, uh, a minister position within the Wagadugan Empire. The idea here is you could garrison a relic in a castle to allow that castle's garrison healing bonus to affect all ally units within its arrow range. Uh, kind of wonky, potentially broken, but I thought it was kind of cool, and I like the idea of giving relics more to do than just plopping them into a monastery. Plus, I already had that relic bonus giving them wood, and it felt kind of weird to give them two different things for relics to do. Just kind of a non-bow across different civilization bonuses, you know what I mean? Before settling on the Kuraleme, I also toyed around with a unique unit called a Ghana, namely a warchief. My idea would be it would be some sort of buffing unit that could boost allies within its line of sight. Kind of like what I did on my build of the Georgians. Check out that video here. Uh, I ended up not going with it, both because I thought calling a unit Ghana could confuse people, and also because the civilization was weird enough already, so I wanted to give it a little bit more of a conventional unique unit to back up all of its wonky bonuses and technologies. Uh, I also briefly toyed with the idea of a Grio unique unit. Uh, griots were pretty common across all of Western Africa. They were like storytellers uh, with a little bit of a religious connotation. The griot that I was thinking about implementing here would be a monk type unique unit that could not convert, but would heal much faster and could actually overheal a unit, giving it more maximum HP than it normally would have, up to some sort of percentage based cap. So in summary, I had all sorts of ideas for the Wagadugans, and the, the combination that you see now was the one that I felt had the most harmony while still being as loyal as possible to the history.
Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me ramble about medieval West Africa. Before we sign off, as I established last time, we're going to be taking a look at the good old likelyometer. How likely do I think it is that a civilization like Wagadu or Ghana or similar could actually make it into the game in an upcoming expansion? And the Wagaduans rank in at... An 8 out of 10. Yes, I think that there is a very good chance that they could make it into the game, though more likely under the name the Ghanaians. That's just a, a more common and probably more accessible name, even if it is less historically accurate. As always, I'd love to hear your opinions on my build for the Wagadugans. What do you think I did well? What do you think I did poorly? What would you have done differently? And what civilizations would you like to see me tackle in the future? Additionally, did my build happen to teach you anything new about history? Medieval Africa is such a vast and underrated topic. I, I really enjoyed the research behind this video, and I very much look forward to doing another African civilization in the near future. But until next time, my friends, my name has been Robbie Howell, and ciao for now.